Star Trek First Contact is the 3,967th worst film ever made. By no stretch of the imagination is it anywhere near as bad as Generations, which ranks in at number one, with baby geniuses in a close second. Now you ask yourself, how? I mean, it can't be that bad. It's got action, it's got the Borg, it's got explosions, and they even walk around on the outside of the ship, and Worf cuts a Borg's arm off with a sword. And what's also awesome is that it doesn't have a cartoon chipmunk or a little kid. But I'll tell you why I hate it. It's because it's a dumb down, dumb action movie. And it lacks a really good, complicated story. Like a lot of the TNG episodes had. Heck, I would have taken any two-part or TNG episode over this piece of shit. But basically what I'm trying to say is that it's like a less than stellar Borg movie. I mean, you can't ever outdo the best of both worlds. Now that would have made for an epic fucking movie. The, the, see, well, you see, the thing is, they couldn't have done the same kind of story in the best of both worlds, because everyone would have just compared it to that. Like the Borg invading the Federation kind of thing. But that's the exciting stuff. So instead they had to do this, like, weird time travel plot. But they still wanted to have a scene where the Borg invaded Earth, so they put that in the beginning, even though it made no sense. I'll explain later. Oh, wait, I'll explain now. Number one, the entire plot doesn't make any sense. Time travel plots are hard to do. I wish I could travel back in time and plot my wife's death differently. Maybe in a way that didn't destroy my Cadillac. But this movie ain't no exception. I would think that if the Borg had some kind of magical device that could open a time travel portal, that would be like the most devastating thing ever. But I guess the Borg ain't too smart, because they really blew their one chance with that awesome advantage. So the big plot hole here is why did the Borg have to fight their way to Earth in order to open the time portal there? Why don't they just go in some remote part of the galaxy, open the time portal there, and then go to Earth in the past? When there wasn't a gigantic fleet of starships waiting to fire phasers at them. Then they could have just went right up to Earth, completely unopposed. I don't think the International Space Station would have been up for the challenge. In fact, if the ultimate goal was just to turn Earth into Borgs, like a new method of assimilation... Attack the Earth in the past to assimilate the future. That's what they came here to do, stop first contact. Attack the Earth in the past to assimilate the future. That's what they came here to do, stop first contact. Why didn't they just go back to like 1950 or something? Why did they want to blow up the Phoenix ship? I mean, it's not like they were just trying to prevent Starfleet from forming. They were doing this new method of assimilation, right? So what was their goal? Was the whole time travel plot really just so that the Queen could get Data as her mate? Or was she just bored and thought that up in the meantime? Was she looking for a mate from the beginning? Or did she just see the opportunity while they were working on the whole assimilate Earth's past thing? Is she a multitasker? I know she's a multi-dimensional tasker. You think in such three-dimensional terms. I don't understand. Number two. Why is Picard uninvited to the Borg battle? Suddenly, years after dealing with the Borg on multiple occasions without any notable incidents that might question Picard's judgment, he's inexplicably banned from joining the other ships firing phasers at the Borg cube. Let's just say... Starfleet has every confidence in the Enterprise and her crew. They're just not sure about her captain. They believe that a man who was once captured and assimilated by the Borg should not be put in a situation where he would face them again. You'll take command of Task Force 3, consisting of the Enterprise, the Crazy Horse, and the Agamemnon. Understood. Even that bitch, Admiral Necheryev. Well, she trusted Picard enough to lead a task force that was fighting the Borg that were attacking colonies. To do so would introduce an unstable element to a critical situation. However, this unstable element... Well, he knew exactly where to shoot phasers at to blow the Borg ship up. Target all of your weapons onto the following coordinates. Maybe he should have told them that before the battle started. He could have saved like tens of thousands of lives. Okay, everybody. 
Everybody all fire in the same spot. That's the trick. Don't shoot it all over the place, but fire in the same spot. Number three. Deep Space Nine sends the B team to defend Earth. So the Defiant was actually designed to fight off Borg attacks. That was its primary function. It was designed for one purpose only, to fight and defeat the Borg. The Defiant was the prototype, the first ship in what would have been a new Federation battle fleet. So when the moment finally comes to fight off a fucking Borg invasion, the Defiant shows up with nothing less than the B-Team. It's just Warfing Command, with a handful of rookies. And that guy. Who is that guy? No Cisco. No Bashir. No Kira. No Dax. No Odo. Not even Miles O'Brien. I guess they all had better things to do. Like play darts. Play baseball. Sit around in bathing suits. Hang themselves from balconies. Number four. The Defiant gets special preference. So the Enterprise arrives at the battle. And with hundreds of ships exploding all around them, for some reason they single out the Defiant. The Defiant's losing life support. Bridge to transporter room three. Beam the Defiant survivors aboard. Now how'd they even do that without lowering their shields? When you're neck and neck with a Borg cube, you don't turn your shields off. Would Picard really risk the safety of the entire Enterprise crew to beam up Worf? Number 5. Sloppy Riding and Vague Assumptions So Picard is now able to hear the Borgs talking inside his brain. I can hear them. So he has an instinct where to tell the fleet to fire all their weapons at. Target all of your weapons onto the following coordinates. So they all do this and the ship blows up. Then Worf comes up to the bridge to say hi. Oh, everyone's happy to see him. Riker even has time for a quick joke. You do remember how to fire phasers. <laughs> then Worf asks about his ship. The Defiant. Adrift, but salvageable. How does Picard magically know the status of the Defiant? I didn't see him look at a control panel, or even ask anybody. In fact, the Defiant was actually right next to the Borg cube when it exploded. So how does Picard know it's adrift, and even salvageable? Was he just saying that so Worf felt better? And why would Worf even care about a ship? Moments earlier, he was prepared to fucking ram the thing into the Borg cube, killing himself and everyone else aboard. Prepare for ramming speed! But now all of a sudden he's like... The Defiant. You mean the ship you were just planning to ram into the Borg cube and blow up? Yeah, it's fine. It's salvageable. Number six. Picard tells the computer to make them close. Before getting into the turbo lift, Picard barks out an order at the computer, which lacks many pieces of important information. Computer, mid 21st century civilian clothing. Number one, you have the bridge. If I were the computer, I'd be like, what? Close? Who? Who said that? Where do you want it at? I can replicate y'all some clothes, but where are you going to pick it up at? What size are you? For how many people? Well, do you need shoes, too? Who said that? Number seven, violating the temporal prime directive. So if you're trying to preserve a timeline, even taking the effort to wear period clothing, then why would you bring along data on the initial survey? Data's an albino man made of plastic that sticks out like a sore thumb. And then why would he jump down a hundred feet in front of some black woman with a machine gun and allow himself to get shot right in front of her? Greetings. If she had a phaser, he wouldn't have done that. He would have done the whole duck and cover thing. Because the phaser would have knocked him on his ass, right? Are you alright? The arrow impacted just above my sixth intercostal support. Penetrating my secondary subprocessor. Fortunately, none of my biofunctions seem affected. I guess a machine gun has no effect on a cybernetic life form then. Oh, wait, it does. Number eight. More blatant timeline altering violation. So, even though the Phoenix shows no signs of damage, I guess it's damaged. Picard tells Geordi to bring down the entire engineering staff. Again, they all take the effort of wearing period clothing. 
but they tell everyone about the future. It is one of the pivotal moments in human history, Doc. Poverty, disease, war, they'll all be gone within the next 50 years. I've never seen that kind of technology. That's because it hasn't been invented yet. What? We all grew up hearing about what you did here. Do you get to make first contact with an alien race? Because at 11 o'clock, an alien ship will begin passing through this solar system. And somehow, Troy is now qualified to be the mission control operator. Final launch sequence checks are complete. Everyone's probably like, who's this chick? What happened to Zephyrin Cockring's original co-pilots? Did both of them die? I mean, it looks like he built the ship with three seats. So when history asks, who are your co-pilots? What were their names? Where are they? Is he gonna lie? Then when they ask to talk to the co-pilots, where was he gonna show them these guys over here? It's these guys in the bar. Yeah. Just don't ask so many specific questions, okay? Start building a statue. I guess the Borg attack must have killed everyone involved in the Phoenix Project, except for Cockring and Lily. So if you were one of the people that survived, You'd be like, who are all these weird people all of a sudden helping us launch the rocket up? I'm gonna tell my grandkids about this. And they're gonna tell their friends at school and it's gonna fuck everything up. Number 9. A Tale of Two Picards The problem with the TNG movies, and this one in particular, is that there are two Picards. There's the TV show Picard, who's this enlightened intellectual. He only uses violence as a last resort and he always follows his conscience in a strict code of ethics. I don't have time for this. But I'm also bound by my oath and my conscience to uphold certain principles. But then in the movies, Picard's a crazed, violent psychopath. Mr. Wolf, destroy that thing. Time's up. We're not hunters, Doctor, nor is it our role to exact revenge. I will make them pay for what they've done. Reprogram the torpedoes, Mr. Worf. Let's hope we don't have to use them. Mr. Worf, quantum torpedoes. Ready, sir. Fire. Have we become so fearful? Have we become so cowardly that we must extinguish a man? Because he carries the blood of a current enemy. You see, on the show, Picard had a chance to unleash a deadly virus into the Borg, wiping them out once and for all. But he didn't. You realize that the Borgs were a species, and they had a right to exist just like everybody else. He knew better than to commit genocide. You found a single Borg at a crash site, brought it aboard the Enterprise, studied it, analyzed it, and eventually found a way to send it back to the Borg with a program that would have destroyed the entire collective once and for all. But instead, you nursed the Borg back to health, treated it like a guest, gave it a name, and then sent it home. Now keep in mind, this whole story came after Picard was abducted by the Borgs. And they still didn't want to kill them all. I will make them pay for what they've done. Then there was this other time, right? where Picard was against killing the crystalline entity, a giant crystal creature that basically ate life by the planet load. If we can possibly avoid firing on it, then I would hope Aren't it would be- Aren't you going to kill it? You think like, hey, that's crazy. This thing's sucking the life off of planets. We should just shoot it. I would argue that the crystalline entity has as much right to be here as we do. Off oh, what? You'll kill me? He regarded this thing as a life form that was just doing what it was supposed to do. So long as we are in no danger, I will make every effort to communicate. What? I don't deny that it may be necessary to fire on it, but I look on that as a last resort. What? He's quick to react, quick to do dumb action things, and he always violates orders on a whim. I'm about to commit a direct violation of our orders. I think he does it in every movie. In fact, Picard's orders get violated more often than Counselor Troy. It was a violation. Ah, it doesn't matter so long as you... And there is a big difference between data and a tool. <laughs> Doctor, there is a big difference between you and a virus. 
I guess Kirk established a precedent that if you disobey orders and save Earth, then schools are superiors. They'll even applaud you. But you better be sure you save Earth, because if you don't, then you'll get a court-martial. Military orders are flexible, I guess. Again, just like Counselor Troy. You're unusually limber this morning. She certainly is limber. Oh, that's right, honey pie worked that business. But one thing military orders aren't is still sexy after 45. <coughs> Number 10, Borg and Doors. The Borg seemingly had no problem beaming over to the Enterprise during the split second when the shields were down and transforming half the ship into Borg stuff by making materials out of thin air. But... The Borg seemed to have a problem just opening doors. <laughs> now in this scene, the Borg bang on the doors to sick bay. Dr. Crusher must have had the doors locked, I guess. But anyway, so it takes the Borg 30 minutes to pound through the door. Wouldn't it just have opened when they walked up to it? However, in another scene, when Picard intentionally locks the door to slow them down a little, the Borg figure out how to open it pretty fast by sticking their fingers in the crack. They skipped the whole pounding on it with their fists stage. I guess they adapted. Rah. So the Borg are both technically advanced cybernetic creatures that probably could have overridden the door controls really easily. But at the same time, they're also mindless Frankenstein-like zombies. I guess they're whatever the plot needs them to be. Number 11. Quick one-line cover-ups. There's a lot of moments in this movie where major flaws are covered up by one quick line of explanation. The moon's gravitational field obscured our warp signature. The Vulcans did not detect us. So you'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but then you'd think about it for a second and you'd be like, huh? Wait, wait, wait. Wait, what? Report. The moon's gravitational field obscured our warp signature. The Vulcans did not detect us. Wait, wait. The moon's gravitational field... What, like projected all the way to Earth? That disrupts the Vulcan sensors? Since when? Well, lots of planets have moons. So when the Phoenix jumped to warp speed, that's when the Vulcans scanned and detected the Phoenix, right? So they probably would have started heading over to Earth at that point, running their little scanners the whole time. During that time was when Picard and Data were on the Enterprise trying to kill the Borg Queen, and all sorts of crazy shit was going on. Gas. Borgs. So, what, they didn't detect the Enterprise floating around up there? Because of the moon's gravitational field. Like what causes tides? But what about all those escape pods that were on Earth? At some point you had to go and retrieve all of them and put them back on the ship before you left, right? So the Vulcans didn't notice any of that shit going on? The moon's gravitational field obscured our warp signature. Ah, whatever. So Picard quickly rolls out the idea of getting on a shuttlecraft to help clean the Borg off the deflector dish. They could have sucked them off with tractor beams or something. We can't get to deflector control or the shuttlecraft. But in the previous scene, the other dude said... It looks like the control deck's 26 up to 11. But when they took deck 11, they, they just stopped. He said the Borg stopped on deck 11. What is on deck 11? Hydroponics, stellar cartography, deflector control, no vital system. They would not have stopped there unless it gave them a tactical advantage. They were doing their thing to set the deflector to shop, so they didn't bother going anywhere further up the ship. And so that's when Picard's like, We can't get to deflector control or the shuttlecraft. But the main shuttle bay looks like it's on the top of the ship. From the best I can tell, doing my own research. It looks like it's around decks 5 and 6. So how come they can't get to a shuttlecraft? Well, if we set our phasers to full power, we... No, there's a risk that we'd hit the dish. It's charged with antiprotons. We could destroy half the ship. What? No, there's a risk that we'd hit the dish. It's charged with antiprotons. We could destroy half the ship. Captain, I've reconfigured our warp field to match the chronometric readings of the Borg sphere. Recreate the vortex, Commander. Ah, uh, whatever. Picard's lack of concern for his crew members. Keeping with the subject of Picard being a complete asshole in the movies, I would always think twice before serving under him. On the show, you got a pretty good chance of living. Sure, you might get stuck in the floor. Or maybe get shot in the belly. You could get killed by Nagilum. <laughs> 
Or you could get killed by a tar monster. But in most situations, Picard was highly upset at the loss of even a single crew member. We cannot allow you to do that! As any normal captain would be. We will fight you. In the movies, he's reckless to a level of being completely out of character. Almost half of his crew die in every movie. Let's take a look at first contact. Here, Picard says... We encounter Enterprise crew members who've already been assimilated. Don't hesitate to fire. Believe me, you'll be doing them a favor. Um... Okay. Wasn't Picard rescued from being a Borg and then completely rehabilitated? Same with that guy they call Hugh. Or what about Seven of Nine? Or them little kid Borgs on Voyager? Or those three Borgs from Seven of Nine's Unitard? Or those other Borgs that Chakotay found? So it's pretty obvious that after you've been assimilated, you can still go back. But Picard actually kills some guy halfway through being converted. I mean, give him a chance. This was Ensign Lynch. See, this ain't the same Picard from the show. So then Picard unveils his brilliant plan, which is more reckless than trying to off your wife in a dangerous car accident. Not that I would do such a thing. So he tells his crew that... I believe our goal should be to puncture one of the plasma coolant tanks. Plasma coolant will liquefy organic material on contact. Um, sir? Excuse me, I have some questions. So you don't want us to fire in engineering to avoid hitting the warp core? Okay, that makes sense. But you want us to shoot at the smaller, harder to hit part that's right next to it? The problem is, if we begin firing particle weapons in engineering, there's a risk that we may hit the warp core. I believe our goal should be to puncture one of the plasma coolant tanks. Oh, oh, puncture it. Okay, but it seems like it's highly pressurized. Oh my god. Do you have like a 30 foot long pole I could borrow? Because I don't want to stand right next to it. I mean, I don't want to be the guy that's got to puncture it. Because I'll probably get my flesh melted. Have Sanchez do it. Or McGillicuddy. I'll be, I'll be in the back, supervising. Plasma coolant will liquefy organic material on contact. Wait. Wait, sir? Sir, another question. Why is this part of the engine that contains the flesh-melting gas even puncturable? Shouldn't it be made of, like, solid titanium? Why are there clear windows on this tube? What if the new guy, like, accidentally hit it with a forklift? Jesus H. Christ. The holodeck scene doesn't make any sense. To add variety to the movie's visuals, Picard and Lily go into the holodeck to capture a thing inside a Borg's gut that tells them what they're doing. Now in past episodes, it's been established that if you want to play games on the holodeck, you get dressed up in a costume before you go in. It's happened more times than I can remember. But when Picard and Lily go into the holodeck, the computer puts clothes on them. I have something in satin. I highly doubt that Picard had a suit and a dress there waiting for them. And I don't think they took time to change. So if holographic clothes are projected onto them, wouldn't it be on top of their regular clothes? But we see Lily's arm and her titty cleavage. Is that holographically projected cleavage? But then their faces are their own faces, right? So shouldn't their bodies look like this? They should have little heads and big bodies. Unless they have holographic faces on top of their regular faces that somehow mimic their face movements. Listen, I'm going to go heat up some pizza rolls. Does anybody want any? Email me if you want a pizza roll. Post a comment on this website if you want a pizza roll. And I'll send you one in the mail. Pizza rolls, pizza rolls, zoop pizza roll. Number 14. A room with a view. So when Lily has a phaser pointed at Picard, he leads her into a little room somewhere on the ship. Now after careful analysis of this scene by a team of engineers, we've concluded that this room and this window serve no particular function. Please bear with me while I elaborate. Number one, the only way to access this room is to crawl through a small hole in the wall. 
They enter the room through a small hole in the wall. But yet, when inside the room, there's a control panel and you can stand up. So maybe Picard let her there secretly, because they were already in the Jeffreys tube, and he wanted to show her outer space and prove they were aboard a spaceship. But then after they become friends, they go to leave through the same hole in the wall. Why didn't they leave through a normal door? Because they were hiding from the Borg, you say. Wrong, because in the very next scene, they are brazenly walking around the hallways again. So apparently, the only way in and out of this room is through a hole in the wall. Sucks to be the guy assigned to work in that room. Bet's just knees hurt. <laughs> Part 2. The window has no logical function. This window makes no sense to me. Apparently, it has two states of functionality. Closed with the blast door down, and open where it has a force field on. Force field. If you really think about it, Neither function makes sense or has any use. Okay, my nigs, dig this. If it were just a window and its purpose was just to look out of, then it would be a solid state transparent aluminum window. I would not feel comfortable working day in and day out next to a force field window. At any moment, the ship could suffer a power failure for any number of reasons. Then my ass gets sucked out into space. Correction, sir. That's blown out. That is a highly, highly illogical method of having windows. So now we've established that either state of being of this window makes no sense. So maybe it's a force field thing. Well, what do they use force fields for, you ask? Well, they've got one in the brig, which is obviously meant to be turned on and off to let prisoners in and out. And then you also got a cargo bay. That's a gigantic force field. And obviously, the function of that is to let things in and out. Large things. Ships. Cargo. Ships. Cargo. It's not a humongous window to simply look out of. So tell me. In a tiny room in the bottom of the ship that you can only access through a hole in the wall, with no other machinery inside or functionality other than one control panel that is there just to open the blast door, what is going in and out of this room? The hole is too small for a cargo bay. What could even fit through that window? Number 15, a bunch of random shit that makes no sense. Shouldn't Lily have known better than to fire a machine gun right next to a rocket filled with explosive fuel? So the Borg's goal was to assimilate the Enterprise and complete their mission, which was assimilating the entire Earth. Lower your weapons. They'll ignore us till they consider us a threat. So why at any point would there ever be a moment where the Borg wouldn't consider a bunch of humans with guns a threat, or not try to assimilate them in general? My wife ignored me because she never considered me a threat, but then I put her through the windshield of my caddy. So if these people are still at war with other factions, then why the 50,000 watt floodlights lighting up their campsite? You'd think you'd want to keep a low profile at night, What's the point of the Borg trying to contact the Borg in the Delta Quadrant? They ain't gonna get there for like 70 years. Why don't they just send a message back through time and contact an earlier generation of the Borg and tell them to go do all the hard work? So then Worf suddenly has a purple space bazooka. He fires it at a bunch of stuntmen and one of them jumps after the explosion. He isn't really propelled by the actual explosion but more so by himself jumping. Oh wait, this is the wrong movie. So Jordy has new eyeballs. It takes a second or two to zoom all the way in on Dr. Cockward. And then BAM! He looks right at Riker's face. Whoa, well, wouldn't he have gotten a bit disoriented there? He forgot to zoom his eyes out. So where did that Borg Queen come from? Was she on the sphere? Was it just her top half on the sphere and the Borg had to carry her around until they found a female body with titties that could wear a barber suit? Did they construct her from scratch because they needed a board queen? Well, maybe she popped in there from another dimension just to see how things were going. If she did that, why didn't she then escape to another dimension instead of getting her flesh melted off? So Dr. Crusher basically had everyone inside the secret escape hatch. But instead of hauling ass out of there, she calls up the EMH to help stall the Borg. However, the time she took explaining to him about how and why he needed to create a diversion ended up being the exact length of time as the diversion itself, thus eliminating the point of the diversion. Please observe. Please 
there's a medical emergency. Twenty Borg are about to break through that door. According we need to time Starfleet to get out of here. Research, Create a diversion. Borg implants can cause severe skin irritation. I'm a doctor, not a doorstop. Perhaps you like. Well, do a dance. Tell the story. I don't care. Just give us a few seconds. For a doctor, this bitch ain't too smart. Plus, she left a little hatch open. Gee, I wonder where everybody went. So then Worf suddenly has a purple space bazooka. Oh wait, everything that happens in the end makes no sense. First Picard is ready to leave, but suddenly he forgot about Data when he hears him inside his brain. Captain. Shouldn't Picard have been aware of the presence of a Borg Queen at this point? You're not leaving, are you? So Picard doesn't know there's a Borg Queen yet, or he doesn't even know what happened to Data. As far as he knows, at this point, Data could be a full-fledged Borg. Go and find your friend. Picard has no weapon or anything like that, and he just walks into the engineering section, apparently without any kind of plan. Okay, so then he meets the Borg Queen. And then we get the idea that she has no real plan either. Neither does Data. Data is just standing there. Data has no idea that Picard was just about to walk right into the engine room even if he did call to him. As far as Data knows, Picard could have been assimilated by the Borg, or Picard could have died. So all three characters are thrust into a scene where none of them have any plan to resolve the situation. So while the self-destruct is counting down, the Queen is hanging out behind a wall, and Data is sleeping standing up. I guess it's a good thing Picard showed up, because the ship would have just blown up then. So to pass the time, they all decide to pointlessly fuck around with each other. Are you offering yourself to us? Offering myself. The Queen reveals that, although she thinks the Borg are a superior life form, she still needs a flawed human. Someone to talk to. Someone who's an individual who could be her soulmate. You wanted more than just another Borg drone. You wanted a human being with a mind of his own who could bridge the gulf between humanity and the Borg. You wanted a counterpart. For no reason, she tells Picard that she wants him to be Locutus again. She doesn't really believe that, but that's what she tells him for no reason. We will add your distinctiveness to our own. Welcome home, Locutus. Picard agrees to be Locutus again in order to save Data's life. Let Data go, and I will take my place at your side. So I suspect that he was fucking with her too. But it turns out he wasn't. He really didn't have a plan, or a trick up his sleeve. But, the Borg Queen turns out she's fucking with him, because we soon realize that she's really quite happy with Data as her new mate. I do not wish to go. As you can see, I have already found an equal. Okay, so why did we just go through that whole song and dance about Locutus then? Why did you just make him into a drone in the ten or so opportunities you had already? Maybe she wanted to hurt Picard's feelings. Maybe she was testing Data, although it's clear at this point she already trusts Data. He will make an excellent drone. And she really didn't have a plan for Picard to become her new mate. Now enter the encryption codes and give me computer control. So of course Data really doesn't have any intentions of being her Borg mate. He's really just fucking with her too. He's done this a lot of times before. Pretend to be the bad guy, and then he winks. Rator Shinsan needs the prisoner. So now Data's fucking with the Borg Queen. All of this is for no reason. I guess he was playing along all this time to gain her trust. But then why is there a force field up? So then for the benefit of the script, Data needlessly draws out his betrayal. You see, the instant he was able to go over and shut off the self-destruct, he could have ran over to that green thing and smashed it open, since he was right by it anyways. Quantum torpedoes locked. Destroy them. But for no reason other than to create tension for the audience, he risks the future of humanity by firing quantum torpedoes at the Phoenix. Now he intentionally set them to miss, of course, and I don't doubt Data's ability to calculate shit, but what if the Phoenix unexpectedly decreased their speed? Or made a slight course correction? An awful big risk to take for, um, 
Let's see, no reason. Then the green vampire gas floods the engine room. And the queen has a moment or two to think. Instead of making a beeline for the doors to get the fuck out of there, she succumbs to pointless emotional revenge and tries to pull Picard down with her. Bitch should have ran outside, locked the doors, and regrouped with some other Borgs. But instead she tries to kill Picard for no reason. So then they clear out all the gas. All the Borgs elsewhere on the ship magically die of lonely hearts. And then Picard, in a true dumb action hero moment, needlessly breaks the Borg Queen's spine when she no longer posed a threat. Probably would have been a good idea to bring the Borg Queen back to the 24th century and have Starfleet scientists study it. Figure out how she could jump from dimension to dimension, Borg weaknesses, how they built a time travel device, what their next plans are. Oh, but it's probably smarter just to break it. You know, Picard should have said lights out before he did it. Or resistance is futile. Resistance is futile. Oh wait, Data said that. Assimilate this. They used all the good ones. What could Picard have said? Hmm. Your reign is over, my queen. And yeah, I would have sucked. Email me if you want a pizza roll.